Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, lots of news. This is a pretty packed news item this week. So we have Intel teasing XE graphics inside what looks like an LGA package and the earnings information. And if you don't care about the money side, you might still be interested in the side of which parts of AMD's business are doing well and are not doing well right now. Ampere potentially inbound for NVIDIA's GTC announcement, which has moved online again after being canceled temporarily and revived. Toshiba addressing the SMR drive controversy that's been going around the last few weeks and plenty more, including researchers suggesting a move away from semiconductor measurements as they're done today and towards measuring by density instead. Before that, this video is brought to you by Gigabyte Aorus RTX 2080 Ti Extreme. The RTX 2080 Ti Extreme is built with a triple axial cooling solution and ready for anyone interested in intermediate GPU overclocking, although it's also up for gaming out of the box. The Gigabyte 2080 Ti can reach the higher performance range required to play games at frame rates at and beyond 144 FPS, coupled particularly well with games like Call of Duty Warzone, Rainbow Six Siege, and other competitive FPSs. Gigabyte's Extreme is built to be a looker for system builders going for extra visual flair. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first up, a quick GN news item. We've restocked our large mod mats in a high quantity on store.gamersnexus.net. If you had one back ordered for a while now, it will ship immediately within the next probably three or four days. And if you want to buy one, it'll ship immediately as well. So we have those back in finally. Thank you for your patience on them. We uh, placed the order back in around December and then getting hit with human malware that obviously caused all kinds of massive logistics and shipping headaches. So it's been a really interesting experience because as you can imagine, the amount of flights going all over the world have obviously decreased and that's driven up the cost of shipping by air and shipping by boat takes eternity so we've got stories to tell about that but uh, one of the best ways to support us is by picking up a mod mat or one of our other products the toolkits we've got an order in those will be back in in the next couple months as well but if you want to grab a mod mat go to store.gamersnexus.net it's a, a large modding surface four feet by two feet in freedom units that we've been selling for about three years now and it's great for protecting whatever surface you're building on it's anti-static conductive and it's made by a factory that makes stuff for clean rooms so they know what they're doing and we've provided all the specs for it and we test them to make sure they abide by those specs and it also has pinout diagrams and other information on it for a bit of design flair and some computer centric uh, modding assistance on the mat so you can grab those on the store it's a great way to support because it reduces our reliance on advertisers you may have noticed in our 10 years of Intel video we ran a mod mat ad instead of a computer hardware ad and we try to really do that as much as we can because the more GN internal ads we can run, if they're successful obviously, then the less reliance we have on hardware manufacturers. So we can kind of continue to, to try and draw back our reliance on traditional advertising means and focus instead on just working directly with the audience, which is also what Patreon's for. Just as a, a quick side note though, if you're interested in the impact of the industry is gonna be similar to the impact to us, uh, shipping was about four to five times higher to get the mod mats to us this time, specifically because of the human malware related issues. So because of human malware, we, we could have gone by boat and saved a whole hell of a lot of money and kept our margins about the same. But the problem is it would take about 60 days to get to us. Typically the boats will end up going to Florida. What's up slackers? We're here in uh, Dunedin, Florida. And that's a hell of a long journey. And then they get trucked up. So. 60 days, it, we know people have been on back order for these for a while now, and people have wanted to buy them for a while, and I know how I would feel in that position, being told that it's gonna take another 60 days, so we went by air, it cost us a fortune, and cut our margin in half, but we ate the cost, and they're sold at the same price. So enjoy, you can grab one on the store. Uh, I just, I don't, it's too long to wait to do by boat. So they're here, and they're shipping now if you wanna pick one up. And uh, as a quick aside as well, we got a Cat Angels update, if you remember the charity auction we did for them a couple of weeks ago, that raised about $2,450 for their uh, no-kill cat shelter. We got a photo from them of the cat Ebenezer playing games. Unfortunately, it appears that Ebenezer is a console peasant, but maybe it's just a phase. Moving on, AMD earnings. So AMD has reported its earnings for the first quarter, and it looks like AMD notched another record quarter for this one. AMD's first quarter 20 revenue came in at $1.79 billion, and that's a 40% increase year over year, but a 16% decline quarter over quarter. 
Now note that coming from end of year to beginning of year, there's typically a decline for a lot of companies, at least that are retail centric. And that's just because you move out of the holiday buying season and into the usual slowdown for the year. A uh, year-over-year increase, though, is big. So notably, AMD expanded its footing in the mobile segment, and that's largely thanks to the Ryzen 4000 series uh, components that were sold. So AMD's computing and graphics segment is a combined CPU plus GPU segment. They don't break them out individually, unfortunately, which does limit the transparency into each of the two groups. It's probably a strat uh, strategic play. But that combined segment came in at $1.44 billion. That is a 73% increase year over year, but it's down 13% quarter over quarter. AMD attributes the decrease to lower graphics card sales. Enterprise embedded and semi-custom segments revenue was at $348 million, which is down 21% year over year. This was due to lower semi-custom sales, likely thanks to the winding down of the current generation of consoles. And of course, we all know that Xbox Series X is coming up and eventually PS5, so that should see an uptick again soon. AMD says that this was offset by the AMD Epic sales for its server and enterprise CPUs. For next quarter, AMD expects $1.85 billion in revenue, and that at this point would be a 21% increase year over year. This forecast will be driven by demand for Ryzen and Epic processor sales as well. And Further, AMD is positioning itself for aggressive double-digit growth in the server market for the next quarter, based on its own statements to uh, its uh, investors. So AMD also remains on track for Zen 3 and for RDNA 2. At some point later this year, they've reconfirmed that commitment, which actually is a meaningful confirmation just because the uncertainty in manufacturing right now, as was just described a second ago, uh, could have impact of those timelines, but AMD says that it's still targeting 2020 for those. Next up, Intel teases XE graphics inside of an LGA package, or at least something that looks like one. The Intel graphics Twitter account tweeted an image of what would appear to be a massive Xeon at first glance, but that's not what it is. Speculation abounds as to why this is in a socketable package, but this is Intel's XE HP GPU. After initial filming of this episode, Raja Kadori of Intel confirmed via Twitter that it is a data center GPU. Intel's upcoming GPU segment is comprised of three different divisions. They have LP, or low power, so XELP. They have HP, or high performance, XEHP. And then they have HPC, which is going to be the XE high performance computing segment. XELP, we believe, will mostly be relegated to probably IGP solutions, XEHP will probably address the enthusiast and or professional segments, like people who might use Quadros typically. And then XEHPC will be aimed at data centers and at supercomputers. And that's the segment that Intel's probably targeting first. They've more or less confirmed this at this point, and it's where the most money is too. So when you're new to making a piece of silicon like GPUs, going for the most money makes more sense because they're going to need to bring funding, funding in to support the enthusiast endeavors later. But we'll see how it advances. Either way, as for why we posit this is some form of Intel XE or HP, HPC or HP product, Raja Kadori, formerly from AMD and the Radeon team, if you remember, from RTG, made an interesting tweet about the mysterious chip. He said, quote, the bop of all is back, battlefielding and be floating. And for those wondering, BOP of all is a code name of sorts that Intel India has bestowed upon XEHP. So that's where we got the uh, speculation that it's an XEHP chip. BOP of all means father of all. We can take the battlefielding to mean a few things, maybe gaming, but otherwise it's an odd tease. And this particular GPU isn't really likely to be targeted at gaming either, the one that we're seeing, because it appears to be an MCM-based design or multi-chip module design, which NVIDIA is also transitioning towards. They've published white papers on it. And that MCM-based design has four chiplets and four HBM2 e-stacks. And at least that's the best anyone can tell based on the current photos. So it's really interesting. We'll learn more about it as things advance. But B floating is the other part to look at. And that can only really mean one thing, B float 16 
the floating point format is likely what Raja Kadori was referencing. Bfloat 16 is for machine learning and AI acceleration, and Intel has been beefing up its support for Bfloat 16. The AVX 512 instruction set has BF16 extensions, and Intel has been slowly adopting them for certain product families, such as Cooper Lake SP, for example. So Bfloating is an indisputable reference to Intel's HPC goals with XE graphics. Though there also isn't sufficient evidence to suggest it's Intel's Ponte Vecchio GPU either. As for the LGA package, it's most certainly not LGA 1200 or LGA 11.5X. It's possible that it could be some existing type like 3647, but those would just be guesses and we're really not sure. It's likely something new. It's also possible that the GPU is an early sample and the LGA package might just be for convenience. We've certainly seen this before where development units like we saw this at MSI's factory are socketable for rapid prototyping. As to whether this thing is XEHPC or XEHP, we'll just have to wait and see. Ampere is apparently inbound. GTC 2020's keynote is slated for May 14th. GTC is the graphics technology conference or GPU technology conference, as opposed to the Game Developers Conference, or GDC, they're typically hosted around the same time, although current world events have restricted or modified those timelines. It seems that GTC 2020 is on again, though, after multiple attempts at scaling it down, postponing it, and trying to move it to web only. As of this writing, assuming things don't change again, NVIDIA will host its GTC keynote on May 14th, 2020, and assuming they stick to that, the keynote will be delivered virtually via YouTube this time by NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huan, and uh, presumably the leather jacket will be present as well. Quote, get amped for the latest platform breakthroughs in AI, deep learning, autonomous vehicles, robotics, and professional graphics, says NVIDIA. Note the particular use of NVIDIA's word amped here. We can all healthily speculate that NVIDIA placed this not at all subtle hint that it's planning to announce its next generation GPU architecture in the form of Ampere. Ampere is the apparent successor to Turing and has been heavily rumored to underpin the RTX 30 series cards. NVIDIA often uses GTC to announce its more enterprise or professional centric parts. So typically with these announcements, we'll see quadros coming out, like the RTX quadros that came out early in the release cycle last time. Or you might see a Tesla, like the V100, or the Pascal P100, for example. So NVIDIA has not really in the last few years used this to push its GeForce products, but that might change just given that Computex is postponed and all the other events in the middle of the year are going to be done from home or online. So this might be something where we'll see some RTX 3000 teasers, but in the very least, we'll almost certainly see Quadro and uh, professional or enterprise data center types of new graphics architecture announcements. They literally said amped, so that's what it's gonna be. There's no guessing here. Lenovo will, uh, imagine if the social media account manager just used that word without knowing that Ampere existed and all this news comes out and that it's not Ampere. That'd be bad. Lenovo will offer ThinkPads with Fedora workstation for people who like Linux and want to see more widespread adoption of it. This might be interesting news for you. It seems that Lenovo is keen to join Dell in offering OEM solutions that have Linux pre-installed. Lenovo and Red Hat, which are actually down the street from each other, have been working together to bring Fedora workstations to select Lenovo ThinkPad models and possibly more. They're also technically not far from us. Uh, specifically, Lenovo will offer the following models with Fedora Workstation pre-installed. They say the ThinkPad P1 Gen 2, ThinkPad P53, and ThinkPad X1 Gen 8. As stated previously, Lenovo is leaving room to further flesh this lineup out. Lenovo is also shipping the laptops with software from official Fedora repositories. Lenovo seems to be trying to distinguish its Linux offerings from Dell's by offering a different distro. Dell currently offers Ubuntu-based machines. And by also offering a larger swath of models supporting Linux, Lenovo is trying to stand out. Either way, it's good news for Linux users and healthy for the ecosystem to get some more widespread adoption of a different OS. Toshiba has finally decided to be more transparent about its SMR usage in hard drives. This has been a bit of a controversy for the past couple of weeks that we've been following closely, and it's affected mostly the entire hard drive industry. Toshiba specifically is following Seagate and Western Digital in fessing up about its usage of SMR or shingled magnetic recording for respective client hard drives 
and not being wholly upfront about it previously. Of course, Toshiba's comments are replete with their fair share of marketing fluff and defensive statements. Quote, SMR technology is recognized as having an impact on write speeds and drives where this technology is used, especially in the case of continuous random writing. For this reason, Toshiba products are carefully tailored to specific workloads and use cases, says Toshiba. A TLDR then, actually this is a bit longer, but the TSDR is that Toshiba is basically saying they'd rather market the drives based on use cases and workloads that are defined by obscure internal benchmarks rather than explicitly state that they use SMR and aren't suitable for certain usages like write intensive applications and deployments. So WD copped a similar tone and it eventually decided to walk that back a little bit and get a bit more humble. WD released two statements back to back about this last week that we talked about. It went on to claim that it would update its marketing materials and its documentation to clearly state the usage of SMR and what products it is using SMR with and uh, to, to properly identify the drives that this affects. In addition to this, WD claims that it will include benchmarks for those drives in customer facing documentation. To be clear, Toshiba has not said that, neither has Seagate for that matter. So WD gets a bit more credit for doing uh, the extra five minutes of work. However, not for nothing, Toshiba has disclosed exactly what drives use SMR and it's a bit more than they let on originally. The following drives from Toshiba use SMR. P306 terabytes, P304 terabytes, DTO2 6 terabytes, DTO2 4 terabytes, DTO2 V6 terabytes, DTO2 V4, L200 2 terabytes, L201, uh, MQ04 2 terabytes, and MQ04 1 terabyte. We originally said we weren't hopeful that the three hard drive makers would reverse course here, but it seems that we may have spoken too soon. Although Toshiba and Seagate could at least match Western Digital's efforts, it's good to see all of them come clean to some extent here. It would be nice to see companies not engage in such nebulous tactics to begin with, but that's marketing. This story is really interesting and a lot of you in the audience of enthusiasts should likely pay attention to this one because it could affect the way we talk about processors and process in the future of silicon and semiconductors. Semiconductor manufacturers have long used the minimum gate length of a transistor to identify the process node that it's being used in. As the technology has become even smaller, the nanometer number attached to it has become more confusing. They're not directly comparable. You really can't directly compare Intel's 10 nanometer to TSMC's 7 nanometer based just on a node number. This is something that we've talked about before and we even have a video about it with David Cantor, who's an analyst in the industry, and you should check out our video with him talking about Intel 10 nanometer delays if you wanna learn more. A recent research paper outlines a new metric for measuring semiconductors, one based on density rather than gate length. The paper is penned by nine authors, including researchers at Berkeley, Stanford, MIT, the University of California, and one researcher from TSMC. The paper proposes that by using a standardized density metric for measuring the advancement of semiconductors, we can eliminate the confusing node naming, which in recent years has become equal parts marketing or even more heavily marketing than actual technology. Intel actually floated a similar idea several years ago and it's not much of a surprise that Intel would do this because Intel really, despite how it's perceived, is a manufacturing company first, or at least that's how it was founded before becoming an engineering company, which happened later and over time. So when Intel floated this idea, there was debate and there has always been debate over how you would quantify the metric in terms of density of transistors. Issues come up when you start talking about logic, memory, and connectivity, and this research paper addresses all of those points and talks about how to roll it into a more universal number that's comparable across the different nanometer numbers that are attached to a process. Quote, thus we propose the use of the following three-part number as a metric to gauge advancement of future semiconductor technologies. DL, DM, and DC. DL is the density of logic transistors in millimeters squared. DM is the bit density of main memory, currently the off-chip DRAM density. And DC is the density of connections between the main memory and logic, reads the paper. As the researchers frame it, the LMC density metric would be better suited to capture the progress in logic, memory, and packaging integration technologies in a chip, which researchers claim have become decoupled from a simple node number. And we'd agree with that sentiment. The LMC metric also doesn't have to completely replace node numbers, but it can supplement them. 
Quote, while companies may continue to use their preferred labels to market their technologies, the LMC density metric can serve as a common language to gauge technology advances among semiconductor manufacturers for their customers and other parties to facilitate clear communication. The metric accounts for the benefits that come from the integration of logic, memory, and connectivity into the system. In addition to being consistent with historical trends and our intuition about computing systems, the LMC density metric is applicable and extensible to future logic, memory, and packaging integration technologies, the researchers say. The paper also points out that we currently have no meaningful way to identify the progress of chips once we sink below the one nanometer mark and run out of nanometer numbers. You'd have to change to a different unit or change to a different measurement methodology. Thus, even more rationale for gauging chips by density rather than an arbitrary nanometer number. A quick recap on Comet Lake S. So we have a whole separate video on this. For the most part, if you want to, you can skip this chunk of the news and jump to the next one. If you already know everything there is to know, you watch the whole video about Intel's 10 series, but there's a few things we'd like to point out. And one of those is that <laughs> the names are terrible. So we already said that, but it's become more clear because uh, a couple of you saw our 10 years of Intel benchmarks. And in one or two of the charts, we have a 10900X present. And the viewers who noticed that and didn't quite know the difference between X and K or didn't see the difference, just saw 10900, uh, sent us emails and asked, did you accidentally break embargo? And while we very much appreciate your attention to detail there, uh, no, we didn't. So the names are bad. 10900X is a product that already ex exists. And one of the concerns we have is that view count would probably typically be influenced if people think that they've already watched this review of this thing, even though the 10900K is explicitly a very different product and is brand new. So uh, fortunately, all of the discussion beforehand should probably prime the audience and viewers so everyone understands that 10900X and K are different. But anyway, the names are bad. Uh, so yeah, you can watch that clip if you want to see the full details. We'll briefly recap it here. The Intel presentation has confirmed a few of the points that we've brought up in these hardware news segments over the past couple of weeks. One of them was die standing. This is something we presented maybe two or three weeks ago at this point as an exclusive GN item that we had uncovered early. And Intel confirmed that the k skew dies specifically, not the rest of them, are sanded down in die height by about 300 microns. And that's supposed to help bring the IHS closer, well, it brings the silicon closer to the substrate is what I really should say. And then the uh, IHS, because you can't change the height of the package, because then you have mechanical issues with mounting in the socket and with coolers, the IHS ends up taking up that 300 microns with extra copper instead. So this is the main move that Intel's making and marketing for its KCU parts. It should help with thermals, especially moving to an extra two cores on something that's still fast and higher power consumption in theory based on their numbers than a 9900K. So that's one of the big changes. It does confirm what we showed previously. And LGA 1200 also formally confirmed now, although it was known to support LGA 11.5X cooler, something we talked about last week as well. Intel also confirming its use of stim or more solder. What we don't know is if that's on literally all of them or if it's just on the k skew parts. We'll find out quickly. Uh, we also asked if the silicone adhesive height would be changing but didn't receive an answer in the call. Uh, Intel cut its call extremely short. So that's the most important parts of this other than the hard specs. The extra 49 pins on the LGA 1200 socket when we asked were for, quote, improved power delivery and support for future incremental I.O. features. Future incremental I.O. features really can only mean one thing, which is going to be PCIe Gen 4. And previously we received this information, but we confirmed it again with motherboard manufacturers. And basically the plan is that the, uh, I don't know if it's Rocket Lake, is that their next code name? But the next CPU that's supposed to come out is theoretically going to be supported in Z490. We can't promise that, but that's what the motherboard vendors are being told by Intel right now. And it, it kind of makes sense if, based on the LGA 1200 socket, that Intel would want to make it socketable in Z490, and then you would get PCIe Gen 4 at least to the first PCIe graphics slot and maybe to an M.2 device. But that's kind of the plan for those. For the rest, Intel is extending the confusing naming. They are also extending uh, TVB, or Thermal Velocity Boost, which is kind of like a GPU boost, except much dumber. Not, not in a negative way to say that, but in the sense of the technology is not 
trying to do anything too smart. It's just, are you above or below threshold for power and thermal? Yes, no. If yes, then you don't get any extra performance. And if no, then you get maybe an extra 100 megahertz. But we'll leave the rest of this discussion to our previous video. The i3 is basically the old i7, which we talked about in news as well. And that should kind of wrap up most of our hardware news storylines from these Intel features. NVIDIA building a cheap open source ventilator. NVIDIA's chief scientist, Bill Daly, has put together a design for a ventilator that is both low in cost and open source. The design is aimed at being easy to assemble and can be built for around 400 bucks. However, with open source 3D printed parts, the cost could get closer to $100. Daly's design is based around two components, a proportional valve and a microcontroller. Daly's early prototype consisted of a solenoid valve, a microcontroller taken from a cheap computer, several common pipe fittings, and quote, several thousand lines of code. That early design successfully inflated and deflated a rubber glove and was the start of it. Now, the design has advanced to being successfully tested on a Lund simulator. After seeking expert input from medical and engineering professionals, Daly is also seeking to gain emergency use authorization from the FDA, which will allow his design to move into the manufacturing phase. Daly claims he can bolt the device's components together in five minutes and that the entire ventilator can be attached to a simple display and slid into a compact Pelican carrying case. It's kind of interesting to see hacked together how it works if you want to look at the video, they've got one uploaded. Last part, hardware sales. We noticed the Corsair K95 RGB Platinum has dropped a little bit in price. It's not nearly like what you see for Black Friday where these keywords go like 50% off. But if you're looking for one, it's reduced. We'll link it in the description. And then Trident Z 16 gigabyte 3600 memory is also a bit reduced right now. But DRAM prices do seem to be on the rise again overall. This one's not as high as it would otherwise be though. So we'll link those in the description below. And that's it for this news video. Thanks for watching. Support us on store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.